So back to uh, Thomas Hobbes. And you remember last class that we met, um, I said that, that Hobbes, in a way, presents a challenge to ethics, as, as we've thought of it so far. So he, if Hobbes is right, that means that Aristotle and Plato and Thomas Aquinas uh, have to be wrong on certain basic things. Also, the people that we're going to study after Hobbes, like the utilitarians we're starting next week, Bentham and Mill, and then Kant, if Hobbes is right, they have to be wrong about certain really fundamental things. Um, and why is it? Well, last class we looked at Hobbes' understanding of human nature and about moral concepts. Um, what do you remember from that? What did he say the good was? Anyone remember? Say again? Only being God. You, I think you're thinking Thomas Aquinas. Um, easy to mix up, Thomas Hobbes, Thomas Aquinas. Um, Hobbes did believe in God in a weird kind of way that nobody else seems to share with him. He's, he's, he's a materialist, so God has to be a material body. So. Anyone else remember? Yeah. It's basically up to the individual. Yeah. Everyone so. We have a name for this sort of basic idea called relativism, that whatever is good, just, right, beautiful, any of those sorts of things are relative to the society or to the individual. There is no such thing as a standard of right and wrong per se in nature. Whereas somebody like Thomas Aquinas thought, yeah, there, there is. God created everything. He put a, a natural law into human beings that they can discover. Hobbes is going to talk about natural law, but he means something very, very different than Thomas Aquinas. Um, so now, if we don't agree on really basic things, like what's good, what's bad, um, we're probably going to run into some problems. It's not just in society, it's just getting to society that we're going to have problems. And so Hobbes talks about what he calls a, a state of nature, a natural condition of mankind, but we can think humankind. We don't have to, we're not wedded to his, his vocabulary. Um, and, oh, good. Um, when we're in the state of nature, if you think about human beings, like look around at your classmates, um, how are they similar to you? Other than being at Marist College and smart enough to get in or something like that. How are, how are all these other people similar to you? We're all in the human form, you know, the species type thing. But okay, that, that, that's an important part. What were you going to say? We're all using the same purpose to learn. You all have some same purpose. That, that's going to be important too, a little bit later. Um, what else? What, yeah. You all have the, that's going to be very important. You all have the ability to reason. Um, and that's coming from your human form, right? That, that actually culminates in this capacity to, to learn. Uh, what about your physical strength? Some of you are stronger, some of you are weaker. Um, some of you are athletes, some of you are just, you know, doing other things. The athletes are probably physically stronger, have more endurance. But now imagine we're on that, that survivor island. We've all seen the show Survivor. Sometimes it's on an island, sometimes it's, you know, in Costa Rica, not well, Costa Rica's on a peninsula, right? Um, <coughs> let's say it was very brutal. It wasn't like the TV show. On the TV show, they don't usually punch each other or set traps for each other. But imagine there's scarce resources. You know, if you were really out in the wild with, with a bunch of other people, you might cooperate with them or you might kill them. <coughs> and if somebody's an athlete, they're physically stronger than you. And let's not you know, make the assumption that athletes aren't smart or anything like that, because that's, that's not a good assumption. They're probably just as smart as you are, and they're physically stronger. What would you do if it's them or you? How would you even the odds? Uh, learn how to fight. Okay, you could you could master a uh, set of techniques. 
Um, that's, that's where martial arts actually came from, was a bunch of monks. Now monks, you know, spend most of their time meditating and just hanging out, not a lot of time doing physical exercise, and they'd go places and the robbers would rob them, and they said, well, we gotta do something about this. So they developed mar martial arts to, to beat them off. Um, that's a way of equalizing things. What else could they do? There was actually, you know, you know what they, they called the, uh, the Colt um, Revolver out in the Wild West? It had, it had a name. Peacemaker. The Peacemaker and then the Equalizer, right? Because technology and techniques and stratagems, that allows us to sort of put us all on the same level. Some of us are smarter, some of us are faster, some of us are, you know, more persistent than others. But when it comes down to it, uh, if we were all in what Hobbes is called the state of nature, we're all more or less equal. Okay. Um, and says, so he says, from this equality of ability arises hope in, in attaining our ends. So if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, what happens to them? They become enemies. Competition, and I'm not talking about like healthy competition like, you know, Okay, everybody split up into two teams and now we'll play dodgeball for, for the rest of the period. That's healthy competition, right? I'm talking about the sort of competition that gets people to, we often talk about cutthroat business people. Um, cutthroat means that they'd literally kill each other if they could. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but out in Asia, particularly like in Indonesia and places like that, Coke and Pepsi representatives used to kill each other routinely because the stakes were so high and there wasn't a lot of law enforcement. So they, you know, they'd hire somebody to kill their competition. Um, it was one way to get access to, to resources, the resources in this case being a market. Now imagine again we're on that survivor island. What, what are the sort of things that we want, human beings? Yeah. We would probably try to develop some sort of culture to kind of make everything equal and fair for everybody. Like, I don't to know. help each other. Not really fair, but to help everybody out because the, like civilization started because every people realize that, okay, while I'm farming yeah. my corn, I can't also farm this, 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 and this. So yeah. you develop a relationship based on need, not really. Plato tells a story sort of like that in the Republic, right? Um, what do we actually see if we look at ancient societies? They tend to be pretty stratified, don't they? And the warriors tend to be, warriors and priests tend to be on the top, in part because priests provide some social order, usually priests are tied in with judicial functions too. And warriors, because um, if you have a bunch of corn, and those nomads down the, down the well they went in the streets, down, down the steep, uh, want that corn, and you don't have warriors pretty soon, you're going to be slaves of nomads, and you're not going to eat much corn or anything else because they're going to take it. Um, so it, it doesn't end up being equal in most ancient societies. Um, but again, what are the sort of things that we would compete over that you, you can think of? Yeah, food. Food, that's a really basic thing. And we don't just want to have access to food. We want, you know, if, if there's like, if it's between barley cakes and lamb chops, um, and I want the lamb chops and you want the lamb chops, one of us is going to have to eat barley cakes, and we may have to fight over it. Where are you going to say? Oh, like territory? Yes, and why territory? Um, just because that's like where people like mark off for their, I don't know, their home's going to be all right. So. The homes are, are a big part of it, but what, what else do you do on your territory? What are you going to say? Oh, I was going to say like personal species. Personal space, yes, yeah, some people don't like people, you know, right in their face. Where do you say it's your parents? Oh, land. Land, right. What do you do with land? We don't do this an awful lot anymore. Like grow food. And yeah, you want as much land as possible like because you can farm that, and when you're not farming, you might fish or hunt game or, or pick berries or whatever, and that's, that's part of what you would need. So, you know, families, when they would go out on the frontier, People would mark off land for themselves. If you encroach on somebody else's land on the American frontier, you were in trouble. Especially if you started eating their food. People didn't like that. Um, so food, 
What else do we compete over? Women. Women? Do women compete over women? Yes. Well, some, some do. What else do they compete over? Men. Men. Mates. Let's say mates in general. Uh, people compete o over, over that, and that happens even once we do have a society, right? The, the level of competition can often, can often be very high. Walk past the supermarket, and what do you see? That, that so-and-so has broken up with so-and-so, and now they're dating somebody else, and they stole them, you know, and it's all this very martial language. Um, okay, so mates, food, yeah. Um, power? Yeah. And this is where we're going to get to why it becomes so dangerous to be a human being, perhaps. Other animals compete over food and, and mates, right? Deer, are, you know, go out and they clash their antlers together and sometimes they poke each other. Um, some animals do it in sort of non-violent ways, you know, just doing displays, but most of them fight with each other. And a lot of them are territorial. Um, and they definitely compete over food. Sometimes they compete over things like um, protecting offspring. You know, like lions. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but lions are kind of interesting. They're one of they're one of the species that's like us, where they have a high level of what we call intraspecies predation. That means that a lot of the humans that die are killed by other humans. A lot of the lions that die. How does that happen? Well, when, when a couple male lions come in and take over the pride, any of you guys watch the Nature Channel or National Geographic, what's the first thing they do after they chase off the, or kill the old big lion male, and then, you know, um, that they fight the females a little bit, yeah. They kill the babies. They kill all the other babies, yeah, to, to eliminate. They're almost, you know, they're sort of the, the regal ones. They want to destroy the bloodlines of all the other lions. Chimpanzees actually turn out to be the most like us when it comes to intraspecies predation. Chimpanzees will kill each other over land. And they will actually do something that Hobbes is going to talk about here. So we have competition, right? Um, and let's just go a little bit further. I mean, Hobbes also thinks about this in terms of envy. You've got something, I want your something. You got a nice house. I'd like to have your house. And the only thing that's really keeping me back from, from taking it is whatever you know, sort of moral sense I have and the threat of punishment and the fact that you might hurt me for taking that house or, or hurt me in some way. Um, that's the way Hobbes sees it. So like he says, um, It comes to pass that where an invader has no more to fear than another man's single power, if one plants, sows, builds, or possesses a convenient seat, others may probably be expected to come prepared with forces to dispossess and deprive him, not only of the fruit of his labor, but also of his life or his liberty. Um, every ancient society have, that develops past a certain point has slavery. And some people are turned into slaves very often through war. Um, also through, through death. Um, people kill each other over these sorts of things. So there's competition. Now, if I know that you are eyeing me up, and you'd like to have what I have, and you'd probably stop in and get it, what do you think I should do? Stop at nothing to protect it. Yeah. So what, what is, stop at nothing to protect it. What does that translate into? As far as like my practical reason. I know you're out to get my stuff, or my land, or my wife and children, or my house, or whatever. What should I do? Uh, it kind of escalates to either killing the person that's trying to get your stuff, or them killing you to get it. Yeah, I mean, I could try to you know, fortify it and, and make it you know, seem really unappealing so you go and prey on the next person. But I'd probably be better off just waiting until you're weak. Maybe sleeping than you. That's practical reasoning. Not all practical reasoning is, you know, well, I want this, I need friends to have the good. It's not all, you know, nice stuff. 
This is also practical reasoning. Uh, and, and it extends not just to individuals, but to countries. You know, a long time ago, um, when I was in, in elementary and then high school, and then actually, uh, it ended just soon after I got out of high school, we were in what was called the Cold War with the Soviet Union. And we had all these nuclear warheads pointed at the Soviet Union, and they had a lot pointed at us. And in, um, from about 1983 to 1986, it was pretty dicey. We actually thought we might go to hot war. Um, when uh, Gaddafi had his line of death, you know, rhetoric, and, and we went and, and did some bombing, we fully expected that we might uh, end up not finishing high school and being drafted and going off to fight. And then when I went into the army, it was still Cold War, and we were training to fight in Europe, mainly in Germany, which would be banned for the Germans. <coughs> fight the, the Warsaw Pact and Soviet forces eye to eye, toe to toe. And our life expectancy, I was a combat engineer, our life expectancy was 30 minutes on, on that sort of battlefield. Just slightly more than infantry, because we were actually going to go out in front of the infantry. Um, and it was, it, it was expected and, that people would actually use tactical nuclear warheads uh, during, during that fight. And the Russians actually, we, we know this from looking at some of their stuff, they were actually discussing whether to go to war. Their situation was worsening and weakening. And from about 1983 to 1986, that was the cusp period where if they were going to go to war, that it would have happened. Um, what kept them from doing that? Why, why didn't we nuke each other? Well, there was this thing called mutual assured destruction. And it was based on this premise that nobody could afford to use it that if you get, let's say you're Russia and I'm, I'm the President of the United States, and I want to launch a preemptive attack, as soon as I start launching that attack, you start launching at me. So that kept us from going to war. This, what, what Hobbes is calling um, anticipation. Reasoning that this, if I do this, this will happen. Now, if you don't have nuclear weapons, and it's just swords, or guns, or something like that, then maybe um, when your enemy, or somebody who's a potential enemy is weak, maybe you should take them out. All right? If, if, some, if you know somebody's going to rob you, you can see them in the dark alley, and you happen to have a gun in your pocket, and there's no police around, and you know that that person's got a gun, and you know they have the intention to, to, you know, rob and maybe kill you. Doesn't it make sense to shoot them? I mean, you could, you know, try to do the thing. I don't want to hurt you, but uh, I will if I have to. You have the gun out. But if you get a gun out and you're not actually intending to use it, you just gave them a gun. You walk up to you and take the gun away, right? Um, Hobbes is after something pretty important here. Now let's take this logic a little bit further. So you want my stuff, and I want your stuff. And I've been reasoning and thinking, you know, maybe I should get rid of them. They're going to be a problem sooner or later. <coughs> Why am I able to do that? Right? that this is what goes to um, the, the thing about having reason, um, being a human being. Um, well, you guys are human beings too, aren't you? So wouldn't you have the same sort of thing running through your head? I mean, it's kind of not logical because it's kind of like a paranoia that you're going to say, oh, this person wants to rob me. Just because they like what you have yeah. and want it a lot doesn't mean that they're going to it doesn't rob give you. It doesn't give you 100% probability, but no, let's so say it's just 50%. Even if it was fifty percent, I mean, if that would have held true, yeah. we'd all kill each other constantly. Oh well, that's that's the state of nature. We live under what Hobbes is calling the social contract. Yes. When law and order breaks down, then Hobbes thinks we go back to the state of nature. Yes. Like if and we're in a riot. Well, the thing I want to you know, into is the reason why we have a social show contract. Yeah. Is because we realize that. It's not a good thing that we constantly kill each other because we want what 
you're right, each other has, and that's a part of our nature. Just like, you know, when we kill each other, you know, we also want to live in peace with each other. So you sound more like Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas than Hobbes, though. Because Hobbes thinks that part of what we do in the social contract is overcome what our human tendencies are. Yeah. We, we go to this not because we, we say, we don't want to be the kind of people who do this sort of thing, <laughs> but because we realize we're the kind of people who want to do this thing, and so are the rest. And this is the best that we can make it hope for. And this is a very pessimistic view of human nature. Um, and it's interesting that you say paranoia, because but there are some scholars who've drawn a connection between sort of the Hobbesian view and the clinical diagnosis of, of paranoia. Also, uh, another one, borderline personality disorder. But more because of stuff that we're not reading at this point. But now let's go. So let's go back to this. You know that that I'm plotting to kill you. <coughs> what should you do? <coughs> and I'm plotting to kill you precisely because I think that you're, you're going to take my stuff. Kill me first. Kill me first. Yeah. So both of us now get into this situation where precisely because the other person is a human being, not just an animal. Because the other person is capable of practical reasoning, of thinking things out, we think, i got to eliminate them. Because they're going to give it to me. Um, then there's a, a third thing that even uh, further raises the stakes. He says, men have no pleasure, but on the contrary, a great deal of grief in keeping company where there's no power able to overawe them all. Why? Every man looketh that his companion should value him at the same rate he sets upon himself. Um, we all want other people to respect, to fear, to love, to want to hang out with, to pick whatever you want with us. And do you think that people tend to overvalue themselves or to undervalue themselves in general? Over. How many, well, let's take a poll. How many of you think that human beings in general tend to overvalue their own goodness, nature, how many of you think that human beings tend to undervalue? Very, very few. Why do you think people tend to undervalue in, in general? Yeah. Um, I don't know, because like, just conversations with people are like, what am I doing wrong? Or, I'm not worth this, I'm not worth that. Yeah. There are, there are some people who are genuinely humble, and then there are some people that are more humble than they want to be. Right? They, they sort of second-guess themselves. But most people aren't like that. Most people, think about when we get in political arguments. Most people say, well, you know, I, I'm probably wrong about this, but I'm going to throw this out here anyway. Now they say, this is the way it is. You guys are all full of it. That's, that's the sort of tendency. We, and what happens, how do you feel when somebody doesn't see eye to eye with you? How do other people? They like it. Frustrated. Frust yeah, it's, it's frustrating. Um, sometimes, if, if you have problems with anger, it goes from the frustration to anger very quickly. How could you possibly say that? What kind of degenerate are you to think that that could be <coughs> the, the way it is? You know. Um, but we all so we all want people to value us. We all are after what Hobbes is calling other people call before this honor, right? <coughs> Do any of you like being made fun of? No. Comedy is always at somebody's expense. It's, it's hard to find comedy where somebody isn't the butt of the joke. I mean, you can make fun of yourself. You can be self-deprecating, let's say, and not go after anybody else. Most comics don't do that. Most comics um, go after the audience, or they go after somebody the audience doesn't like. That's not going to make people very happy. That makes people mad. Um, what else? He says, upon all signs of contempt or undervaluing. So remember what contempt was for Hobbes. Contempt was not thinking any, not hating, not loving something. Um, so when somebody doesn't hate you or doesn't love you, um, because they're Bless you, you're preoccupied with other things. You're more interested in what's going on in their life. Hobbes thinks you're not going to like that. 
and he thinks this is part of part of the way we are. That we, we tend to want other people to be sort of in our orbit. We want to be the top dog or the queen bee. Um, so what happens? Well, this makes us want to, um, as he says, extort a greater value from his contenders by damage and from others by example. So very often people, you know, you, you probably remember this from like middle school and elementary school. There was some kid who was trying to get attention all the time and maybe do it the wrong way. Just ring a bell. And, you know, you, the teacher would say, well, they're just acting out because they, they're not getting enough attention at home or, or something like that. Um, or remember somebody would pick on somebody because they want to be friends with them. Or um, guys are really bad with this. They pick on a girl that they like because they don't know how to communicate that back in like, middle school. Does this still go on? Yeah? Um, that's the sort of thing that Hobbes is talking about. You want somebody else to look up to you, to talk to you, to, to smile at you, to want to hang out with you. And you're going to get attention from them one way or another. Um, and because what you really want is to be honored. You want to be in with them. And if you can't get it the good way, if they won't give it to you freely, well, then you force them. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I know how I was saying that social contract isn't our natural thing. But if yeah. we want to be the alpha person, and let people love us and yeah. stuff like that, you can't have that without some sort of social contract. Well, you could. I mean, you could enslave everybody, right? Yeah, but then they wouldn't really be honoring you. They wouldn't really think of you. Hobbes thinks they would, because, again, Hobbes has this very pessimistic view of human nature where what does honor really mean? So it means we're afraid of each other, that we, we recognize each other's power and we you know, bow down to it. Um, so. Now, what you're communicating is something, again, more like an Aristotelian or Thomistic stance. Um, again, remember, if, if Hobbes is right, that, had, that has to be wrong. Hobbes is reducing things. He's um, taking a, a kind of dark view of human nature. Well, maybe we would. As I say, the only way to see if Hobbes is right, though, is to kind of challenge his perspective based on the social contract or natural wanting of the social contract rather than it's just a necessity okay. to because of the natural things we want according to how. Yeah. So somebody like Aristotle thinks um, things like I don't know, to me Aristotle thinks that social contract is a natural thing for us. Yeah. But mm -hmm. thinks that it's just like a necessity to what we really want materialistically here. Yeah. Aristotle thinks that there's sort of a this is part of what we are as human beings, that we're social by nature. And we want to get along, but, but unfortunately we, we end up getting into conflicts and then things spill out. Hobbes thinks that the conflict is at the very heart of what it is to be a human being. Um, so that, that is a bit different. Um, but let's see how we get to the social country. But before that, so we're in the state of nature. What is the state of nature like? He says, state of nature is a state of war. A state of war of all against all doesn't mean that we're all actually physically fighting all of the time, but it means that we're always prone to it. That there's, there's no possible check on it, that things could go off at any time. Um, and he says, um, whatsoever, therefore, is consequent to a time of war where every man is enemy to every man, in such condition there is no place for industry, because the fruit thereof is uncertain, <coughs> Therefore, no culture of the earth, no navigation. It, and he goes on and he says, um, the thing that's worst of this all, uh, completely is continual fear. Because if, if you have this dynamic going on, everybody that you see could be a threat, including even the people you've managed to put under you. Maybe they don't like you know, being ruled. They might try to do you in as well, too. So he says, continual fear and danger of violent death, and the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. If there's only one catchphrase that you should remember with, with Hobbes, nasty, brutish, and short. Right? The life outside of the social contract. 
Um, and then he says, now in this war of all against all, there is no such thing as just and unjust. You can do anything you like. Unfortunately, so can anybody else. So if you want what uh, Mr. Wilby has, it's a nice jacket that he's got there, um, take it from him. Now, of course, if he wants to resist you, he has a perfect right to do that. If he wants to get Mr. Singh to line up with him, uh, to help him, that's perfectly fine too. As a matter of fact, if he sees you eyeing up his jacket, and he wants to build a pitfall or something like that, that's A-OK -okay too. In the state of uh, nature, we can use force or we can use fraud to achieve our ends, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Now, this probably doesn't sound like a place where you want to be, I'm guessing, right? Because in part, because you're used to living outside of the state of nature. Um, who do you think this might appeal to? Yeah. Those who lust for power. Those who lust for power, yeah. Sometimes people are willing to shake the system up so that they can hopefully come out on top. Um, can you think of any other people that, that really might get into this and be like, yeah, this, this is it. This is what I want. People that aren't really part of society, people that feel outcasted from society. That, that's a good way to look at it too, yeah. People who don't derive much benefit from being in society. They could be for a war of all against all. Um, some people already are criminals. Criminal organizations are outside of the social contract. And um, they, they would presumably be in it. Pirates. We still have pirates around, right? They're, they're not under the social contract. How do we, so how do we get out of this? Hobbes says the best motivator for this is fear. And then we reason, right? we use rationality, but it's based on fear. And he says the passions that incline men to peace are fear of death, desire of such things are necessary to commodious living, so the things that we like, and hope by their industry to attain them. And so what reason suggests to us is what we call a natural law. And what is this based on? Self-preservation. So you know, it's not entirely different than Thomas Aquinas' natural law, right? Remember Thomas Aquinas' natural law? All being is, is a good, existence is a good. You should try to protect life. Hobbes is saying, well, protect your life. Don't worry about uh, her life or his life. Worry about your own life. Um, so he says, reason suggests convenient articles of peace upon which men may be drawn to agreement. So Hobbes is thinking that, here's the way it works. We're stuck in this situation. We can think and reason and we can say, how could we get out of this? And we should all come up with more or less the same answers because all of us have reason more or less to the same degree. <coughs> and what are these things? He says, a law of nature is a precept or general rule found out by reason by which a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive to his life, so self-preservation, or taketh away the means of preserving the same. That's also about self-preservation. You need to not do things that will get you killed, not do things that will take away what you need in order to live, and to omit that by which you thinketh it may be less preserved. So, since we're stuck in a war of all against all in the state of nature, what would be the first rule that everybody should seek peace? That everybody should seek to, to get out of this? Um, so he says, it's, it's a preceptor general rule of reason. Every man ought to endeavor peace. <clears throat> now there's a proviso, as far as he has hope of attaining it. So if I, if I think, for example, let's say we're in you know, this, this war of all against all, and let's say this side of the room I think are more reasonable, more, more um, willing to put their desires you know, out of play for a moment, and I think these, these guys, they're, they're all a bunch of hotheads and troublemakers. It would be reasonable for me to try to seek peace with these people and to say, these people we can't seek peace with. As a matter of fact, how about all of us get together 
and we'll form a, a social contract in a society, and then let's, uh, let's, let's keep these people out, because they're trouble. And then each one of you could probably, if you really were reasonable and inclined to seeking peace, you could, you could arrive at the same conclusion. Like, yeah, that sounds really good. Those people, these people are okay. Those people are beyond the pale, right? And then, you know, when some of you try to come into our society, then we kill you or lock you up or drive you away or something like that. Um, now, if you, if you have hope of obtaining it, then you should, you should try to do that. If you don't have hope of obtaining it, then you just stay in the state of war. Hobbes is saying you have to have a realistic chance of getting out of the state of war before you should buy into it. No sort of idealism here. The second, he says, the sum of the right of nature, which is by all means we can to defend ourselves. Uh, he says, when, here's the second law, that a man be willing when others are too, so far as for the peace and defense of himself, he shall think it necessary to lay down his right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow them against themselves. So we have what we would call rights limited by others' rights. So let's, now we'll, let's, we'll bring you guys back in. You're, you're no longer beyond the pale. Um, we're a society, we're going we're gonna to put together sort of a set of rules about um, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Um, we don't want to end up in the state of nature again, because that's, you know, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, what do I have to give up my right to so you can feel okay and safe in your life, possessions, liberty, all that sort of stuff? What do I need to give up? Yeah. Uh, your desire to want something whenever you want it, like just to take something because you want it. I have to, no, it has to do with actions, not so much with desires. Yeah, so, so if, like if you want something of mine, okay. it, you have to give up the desire just to go, or the, the action the action just to go take it. Because I, I, can, I can desire it as much as I like, so yeah. long as, so theft, you got to give up theft? What, what were you going to say? Um, like the freedom of doing things. What kind of things? Chewing gum is okay, right? That's not hurting anybody. What would be something I shouldn't do? Kill people. Kill people, yeah. Give up the right to use whatever violent means I want to. What were you going to say? The right to do whatever they want when they want. Kind of dropping that attitude. Well, again, um, <laughs> it's not so much about desires, per se, as about actions. So what's another thing that people tend to want to do that we, should, we shouldn't do if we want to avoid this. What do you think of? Don't kill, don't steal. What else? Don't beat up somebody just because you feel like it. Don't commit assault, yeah. So. Um, we're getting somewhere now. What else should we not do? What should we, in the state of nature, you can do anything you like to anybody, whenever you want to. Provided you can get away with it. What else should we give up? Property, life and limb. Well, we'll get to some of these when we get to the other laws. It's, it's interesting that some of the other things haven't um, come up. Let's look at some of these other laws of nature. The third law of nature, he says, men perform their covenants made. So if you make a promise, like say a contract with somebody, you have to deliver it. Because if you're not, what you're doing is you're putting people back in the state of nature. If we can't rely on other people to do what they say they're going to do, that, you know, like let's say with, I, I'm going to give you some money today to give me some corn tomorrow. Uh, if you can't rely on them for that, how can you rely on them for this big promise, which is I'm not going to do these things, you're not going to do these things. So it, it says we have to behave in such a way as to be trustworthy in each other. Um, now he says something interesting here. You notice I wrote this thing sovereign up here. We haven't talked much about that yet. One of the problems with the state of nature is there's nobody to actually make sure that things go the way they should. There's no cops, there's no army, there's no judges, there's no king, 
there's no magistrate. Um, he says, before the names of just and unjust can have place, there must be some coercive power to compel men equally to the performance of their punishments, or to the performance of their covenants, by the terror of some punishment greater than the benefit they expect to, to gain by the breach of it. So what we have to have, if the Hobbesian thing is going to work, the social contract, there has to be some sort of authority. And that authority has to have almost unlimited power. Because if you start limiting their power, then people are going to start to do the wrong things. So how do you keep people from killing other people? Well, you threaten to kill them after you torture them. In, you know, in medieval and early modern times, they didn't just kill people. They would, they would do some stuff to them first and then kill them because they wanted to show everybody else killing is not a good thing and how do you do that? Make it, you know, um, make it much more painful to, to suffer the penalty. Um, stealing, you know, cutting off somebody, somebody's hand seems very barbaric, right? It's still done in some places. But it certainly sends a strong message, doesn't it? That stealing is, is really bad and can break down the social contract. Uh, that's what the sovereign, Hobbes' the sovereign, would, would do. Fourth law of nature, he says, when a man receives a benefit from another of mere grace, that means that somebody's generous to another, that he endeavor that he which giveth it have no reasonable cause to repent him of his good will. Um, now, that's kind of, you know, florid you know, 17th century language. What is he talking about there? Somebody gives you something, you should be grateful. Don't throw it back in their face. Don't take advantage of them for doing that. Hobbes thinks that if, if this is going to work, that's one of the things that has to govern our behavior. So, you know, don't kill, don't steal, keep your promises, don't be an ingrate. Doesn't seem quite on the same level as don't kill, does it? Does it? But it's important. If we want society to, to work, according to Hobbes, that's part of what we need. Bless you. Fifth law of nature, he says, is complacence. That is to say, every man strive to accommodate himself to the rest. So if I have one set of political opinions and you have another set of political opinions, should I get in your face and, and you know shout at you? Um, call you stupid for believing what you do, threaten to boycott your stores, that sort of thing. That would be to put us back in the state of nature, wouldn't it? Pretty quickly. Because if I'm, if I'm willing to do that, you can tell I don't honor you at all. I don't care what you think. And if I don't care what you think, or I consider you to be scum, why wouldn't I do all these other bad things to you? Plus, you know, I'm going to make you angry. And, and when you're angry, you're going to be tempted to do bad things to me, aren't you? What are all the things we disagree about besides politics? Uh, religion. Okay, religion is a big one. A huge one in Hobbes' time. People were killing each other over, over religion at that time. <coughs> Burning each other, too. Our, uh, general duty to each other as a society we disagree on. That moral theory. Hobbes actually thinks that in this ideal society, get rid of the books of Aristotle, because they are just provoking people. People are using those to argue with each other about this sort of stuff. That's contentious. You know, we don't want people fighting with each other. We don't want people to be getting angry at each other over and over So moral theory, religion, politics. What else do people get angry about in your your view? your experience? What have you recently had? Yeah. Economic. Economic stuff, yeah. This, this whole Occupy Wall Street movement and also to a lesser extent the Tea Party movement before, which are both angry um, uh, and pretty just, you know, the Occupy Wall Street one was probably more disruptive. Um, Hobbes wouldn't stand for that at all. What were you going to say? Um, sorts. Yeah. You know what the word fan comes from, right? It's a slightly longer word. It's a short for fanatic. Because people, I mean, it doesn't happen as often here. Here, when we have riots over sports, it tends to be like the winning team 
for the World Series. I, like, I remember when the Brewers won the World Series, and people in Milwaukee, it was like 1987, rioted. And they were turning over cars and, you know, like, busting in windows and bars and punching each other. And this is how they celebrated <coughs> winning. Imagine if they'd lost. <laughs> um, but, you know, what happens in some other countries? People go crazy. Soccer hooligans beat each other up, you know. Sometimes they get together just for the fun of beating each other up. People tear up, you know, the stadium and throw the, the, the seats at each other. And okay, so sports. Sports can be kind of a, a touchy thing. So we have religion, politics, economics, moral <coughs> theory, sports. Anything else people get heated and angry about that you can think of? Yeah. Say again? The healthcare system, okay. Um, the, you know, there was actually, I don't know if you guys saw this, there was, this is not exactly related to it. There was a shooting in an emergency room in, in New York last night. Um, some, uh, somebody was in the emergency room and somebody else saw them there and they had their, their friends there and then they brought their friends in and they, they shot a couple Shots. Luckily, people just got grazed. Like, well, a security guard got hit, and a nurse got hit. They didn't hit the guys, of course, because most gangbangers are terrible shots, because they don't, they don't actually practice shooting. Um, and, uh, but, you know, they were willing to fight in an emergency room. I mean, that's state of nature stuff. That's not the sort of thing you're talking about, like getting angry about health care. The people are starting to get angry and angry about it. Who should get medicines? Who should what about celebrities? People ever get upset about or defend celebrities? Um, will they fight with each other, you think? They'll get angry. So this is all part of complacence. Not doing that sort of thing. Not, not getting into contentious conversations. Um, sixth law of nature, upon caution of the future time, a man ought to pardon the offenses past of those who repenting desired. So we should be willing to put the past behind us, not carry out uh, vendettas. Right? Um, let's skip down a little bit. In the eighth place, for a law of nature. So this is what's needed in order to have a, a working society. No man by deed, word, countenance, or gesture declare hatred or contempt for us. That would be hard to pull off, wouldn't it? I have a hard time, and I, I have been trying for years to curb myself of my tendency to be contemptuous of uh, some people's views that, that I think are, are long-headed. Um, I have a hard time doing that myself. I see people constantly um, expressing contempt for each other. About these these things that we just talked about, like healthcare, politics, religion, you know, um, economics. If you're going to stay in a social contract and not go back to the state of nature, Hobbes thinks that this would actually be something required. We probably have to have something like a law against treating each other contemptuously. So it wouldn't just be like you know, don't do hate crimes. It would be like, don't say bad things to people that you disagree with. Try to convince them without saying, you're a dummy. Or only an idiot could possibly hold that position. Or you're a terrible person for believing X. Um, or I'm not going to talk to you at all because people like you are totally unreasonable. That would be violating the social contract, Hobbes thinks, and puts us, puts us at risk for being back in a state of nature. Um, Another one that he says is, um, this is all the way at the very bottom of the thing that I made, the condensed handout, the condensed text that I put for you. So the law of nature that they that are in controversy submit their right to the judgment of an arbitrator. So if we feel that we have been wronged and somebody else feels that they haven't wronged us, we should, instead of trying to work it out ourselves, we should submit it to, to a third party and have them try to settle it. Well, why do you think that's a good idea? 
Well, you're already convinced of your side. They're already convinced of their side. Are you being rational at that point? Do you think? Well, it depends on the circumstance, but if you need a third party, then no, you're not being yeah. rational. I mean, if you really have reason on your side, and that third party is not the cause <coughs> bias and the <coughs> bribes, then they will end up siding with you. It's very hard to do that, though, isn't it? Because you know, to be willing to submit to a third party, one second, to, to be willing to submit to a third party is sort of like admitting that you could possibly be wrong, isn't it? Who wants to do that? Anybody here routinely submit their arguments to a third party? Hobbes thinks that's what we'd have to do. What were you hearing since you're very much? I like an irrational person, yeah, really. Reason with a rational person because <coughs> Listen. because well, one person is looking at it objectively yeah. and one isn't. So like trying to convince someone to look at something objectively when they're incapable of doing it, it's impossible to get agreement with them if a rational person is right. Well, when you do that, as you say, you're not looking for agreement from them. Again, this is based less on, on uh, desires or how we feel, and more on our actions. So if we're, let's say we're in some dispute about, well, pick whatever you want. Um, I think the cafeteria should be serving um, meatball subs every single day. That's pretty irrational. <laughs> and you think, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should have other foods. I say, meatball subs, that's it, right? And then you ask me, why do you think that? Because I like meatball subs, and I want them every day. And I could probably eat meatball subs every day, because I like them. Um, OK, now we decide that we're going to submit our judgment to Ms. Ren, right? Because uh, you say, I can't deal with you anymore. You're, you're nuts. Uh, and, and you say, OK, we're both going to present our case to Ms. Ren, and she's going to hear it, and she's going to hear our grounds, and then she'll give a decision. And here's what we're going to both promise to do. Whatever she happens to say, that's going to be the one that, that decides it, right? So I said, yeah, OK. Because I think, of course, that she's going to go my way, because irrational people usually do, right? Um, and, you, and you think, OK, she could maybe say, sure, meatball subs sound great, but she's probably not going to do that, because this does not sound like a really reasonable thing to do. So, are you raising your hand because you want to object to being? No, I, I have a question. <laughs> sure. How do you know if a third party is like biased or rational themselves? Well, that that's one of the problems. Now, that's one. That's also in the laws of nature. Um, he says, um, here's here's one of the laws of nature. If a man be trusted to judge between man and man, so if you're going to be the arbitrator, it's a precept of the law of nature that he deal equally between them. So. You're right. There's this epistemological problem. Can you know that the judge is not biased? Can you know that the judge hasn't been wrong? You, you don't in a lot of cases. If the judge is doing that, they're actually violating the social contract and they're violating the state of nature, or the, 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 sorry, the, um, the law of nature. And they're sort of putting themselves back in, in the state of nature. And so if a judge was found to be corrupt, Hobbes would actually say you should punish them pretty severely. Um, that's, I think, where, where we'll leave a lot. So you, you see, with Hobbes, very stark contrast. He's, he's saying to you, do you want this or do you want this? Either way, you've got some trade offs, right? Here, do anything you like, but there's no right and wrong. And everybody will probably pile on you sooner or later. Over here, we live together in a society, but you better not do anything that violates the social contract, because if you do, um, the sovereign ought to use whatever force is necessary to punish you. So it's not just a matter of keeping your hands off of other people's stuff or not killing them. You also ought to accommodate yourself to them. You ought to submit your judgments to an arbitrator. There's a lot entailed in this. Hobbes thinks this is the best that we can get. Hobbes thinks that this is the way out of that, that threat. Um, 
that's where his, his philosophy sort of naturally leads to. So, um, there's some real problems here. I think you can see some of them. This is what we'll actually be bought. Who keeps the sovereign in check? The sovereign or the majority? There's nobody to keep the sovereign in check. If you allow the majority to do it, the sovereign is no longer sovereign. This is a big problem. This, so this almost, you know, a, you could debate, is this a contractarian ethic, a social contract, or is it an authoritarian ethic, like, like Telemachus, Thrasymachus's notion. So that's what we'll leave off. I'll see all of you on uh, Monday. Um.